So today I'm with Anna Brees from Brees Media. Um, this is a very exciting interview for, jo for Joy Division because um, your name is fairly high profile. Um, but what we want to talk about is really your whole journey. So your past, your present and your future. And um, in your book, which I'm currently reading, which is very, very interesting, um, you talk about your schooling and your family. And I'm interested to learn, um, firstly, why you went on this journey, why you became a journalist that was determined to sort of expose the truth or talk about the truth and where others didn't want to follow that path. Um, so what was it inside you, I want to find out, that um, drove you forwards? Um, so at the moment, if we talk about like where you are right now, you are now running your own media company. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I'm kind of interested in going on one of your courses. That's what I'm doing now. So I'm running workshops and they're doing really, really well. I mean, it's I did some donation based workshops, but what happened in 2022, um, this was after lockdown. And I think a lot of people thought vaccine passports might come back that winter or there might be another lockdown. So we were kind of in a strange limbo position so I ran some donation based workshops then but what happened not not everyone but a lot of people came and they just wanted to meet me <laughs> and they wanted to talk to me about what the last few years have been like go, oh Anna it was lovely to hear you kept me going you're wonderful blah 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 and they weren't make, me, possibly as focused on the training which I fe see as such an important solution so I've I've started running them now in London the London ones are sold out um putting some wow. more on yeah, and this is for me a new media revolution. This is so exciting. I don't think people realize how powerful they have been and they are going to be. But what I would say is you really need to understand how to use these babies. You really um <laughs> it's like screen record. So, you know, I covered the independent inquiry into child sex abuse. They had a live stream on their YouTube channel, and I was able to grab important clips with senior uh, police officers who were saying they had to cover up for VIP pedophiles and politicians. Oh and no real media was doing that. I mean, the Independent covered the Independent. This was, this, this, the final summary report came in around February 2020, just before lockdown, but it was absolutely horrific what we did to our children and how politicians were involved and the church. And it was all there. The Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse had a YouTube channel and they live streamed and I was able to use something called Screen Record. I know how to add subtitles. I know how to write a great headline. I know how to get people to watch on these various different platforms for a video that's so important like that to get out there about what we did to our children to expose this corruption, abuse and injustice. Then we've got the COVID inquiry, exactly the same thing's happening now. The you know, the, the UK COVID inquiry, certain very important information is being shared, you know, top civil servants saying, we just simply didn't understand or realize the impact lockdown could potentially have in terms of domestic violence. You know, we believe, and Alison Pearson, I believe from The Telegraph has shared this, that four children died from abuse during lockdown, you know? And wow. uh, that's in the independent inquiry, sorry, that's the COVID inquiry there's clips coming out. So you'll see media brands talk about Dominic Cummings and various different infighting and swearing. But actually, you know, us individuals, what is the headline for us? What's the content we want to share? So you can get those clips out. And I'm not seeing enough of that. The power that we have to do screen record and to cover the stories we think are important. Um, and I know there's a lot of anxiety and fear about the future, but the future is hours to shape so these workshops are about um but the thing is i get people on the workshops and they just want to grow their business so i have people there for marketing purposes you know i want to uh get more clients as an online coach for my well-being business cool i want to promote music bands on a grassroots level cool these are the people that came last time i had a bbc presenter dallas campbell come he presents bbc sky at night uh, he came wow. to my last workshop. I had a retired grandmother who wants to, um, who's been doing a lot of investigative journalism on Rishi Sunak, for example, and how he mm. holds different companies. So it was such a great variety of people, but it's a skill I think that we all, you know, should learn. And whether you are marketing a pub or marketing your own channel, your podcast, or you're selling um, a service, what I would say is if you're in it for money and if you're in it for your ego, People will pick up on that, yeah? 
Um, if you really want to grow, and there will be financial benefits, you have to add value to people's lives and be really passionate about what you do and have a purpose. And that will come across. So these workshops are for people who maybe want to be an independent politician to run a local campaign on Facebook or stand independent in the next general election. Um, there are so many different ways you can use these, this wonderful tool. What I find a lot of the time is we are talking about, oh, have you watched GB News? Ooh, have you watched BBC? Or I can't believe the mainstream media, blah, 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 a lot of gossip. Um, and I fall into that because it gets your views, it gets lots of engagement. Um, that's how you get the attention. You look at people like Lawrence Fox and Carol Vorderman, you know, what do they call them? Run to gobs. This isn't the future. <laughs> this isn't the future. This isn't where we should be going, in my opinion. No, and I love the last couple of um, pages in your book. It says, um, I feel people have given up thinking that they can make a difference. They're waiting. I guess they're waiting for the government and the media to say sorry. And um, that's what I find frustrating because I think when you become on this journey, you, we give our power to a lot of people, to the schools, to the medical profession, to um, our employers. And suddenly, I think the last few years have taught us, me and Casey, how powerful, as you just said, we are. And um, in actual fact, if you take control of your own life and start listening to your guts, which I feel has been eroded, um, and then you can't, a life shows the, you the path. And um, yeah, like you say, you take away all, like whether you're in it for the money, you just feel, and that's what I feel with you. You had this, uh, just something inside you drove you forwards to speak out and to speak the truth. And you could see that other people weren't. Um, and that just makes it feel sad, isn't it? Because you think, just follow your gut and your gut will show you your, oh, your path. Yeah, I understand. I really do understand. I talk about this in the book, the journalist I spoke to. So I was, a, it was a crazy period, 2020 to 2022. I had BBC News presenters, anchors contacting me, senior journalists from The Telegraph, ITV. I've had conversations with very senior people at ITV and the BBC. I put, in, I put this in the book um, and they would come to me and they'd say, Oh, Anna, we're trying our best. We're trying to reform from within, but I have to pay the mortgage. You know, I'm a single right. mum or I've got um, some, some people were very brave, but some people just couldn't do it because they knew they'd been threatened. I had one person who said, I retweeted something. One of your posts, she said, this is a very, very famous person. And my agent called me up, said, you delete that immediately. You're going to lose your job. So I had a petty income coming in, a very not very much, but I see that as a gift from God. And uh, you talk about motivation. I think about my father. I think about God. And I think about how I had the strength. I used to go into the garden, close my eyes and hold on to this and feel some kind of power or force from above that gave me the courage to do, to do what I did. I got a lot of praise. I got a lot of people saying how wonderful. I, I was, that's nice. A lot of people like that, you know, and, it, and then I got a lot of abuse. <laughs> I got a lot of abuse. I got, uh, and I, I didn't make any money. And, and people would say, you know, I'm trying to sell my workshops. There's 75 pounds in central London, you know, there's not much profit there at all. Um, but why shouldn't I make money? I was before lockdown and I was working with corporate clients. Now I had, and I'm happy to share this story, lots of corporate clients turning work away, very successful business career. So when I was a journalist, I'd do a freelance shift at ITV as a reporter. I'd be on about 170 pounds. Then I created my own business and I was going to big companies like Admiral and um, Wales and West Utilities, Professional Golf Association, Cardiff University. And I was teaching and I was earning really good money, about five times what I was as a journalist. And it was my own business. It was my own, you know, how to film and edit professional content on your mobile to get it out at speed on your platforms via direct broadcasting. I really loved it. Um, and all that work dried up because I couldn't physically go because of lockdown. And I did not want to go to Zoom. How could I go to Zoom and sell my courses via LinkedIn? It just felt so wrong when I had people like Professor Robert Endress come to me from Imperial College London. Um, I think he's the head of systems biology. His exact title is quite lengthy. He came to me and said, Anna, thank you for what you're doing during this coronavirus crisis. The BBC are an embarrassment and a shock. I cannot believe what they are doing in terms of the modelling report that locked the world down. He said he was very critical of Professor Neil Ferguson's modelling report on lockdown. He had a right. He's always also at Imperial College London. And he felt he had nowhere to go. He didn't have a voice. So I came out of retirement, really, to do those interviews. And I knew 
you know, I could do them in a way that I used to work as a, as a TV journalist, but my days as a journalist were kind of over. I was doing training. Uh, this cat here, sorry. My cat. <laughs> yeah. Oh. The crawl all over. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was, so what was I saying? So I, um, I saw this as a really important role. So like we had lots of doctors coming out of retirement to help in the hospitals. I think I could, re I could see how important it was how journalism, how important journalism was. And I have to say that back then, Admiral were a company I'd worked for. They contacted me and said, um, remove our logo from your website, but say, you never say that you've worked for Admiral. Whoa. I was in, but I was baffled. I've gone back to find that email and I found it. And of course you can't say that I didn't work for you. And now we look back, this is what's so insane, yeah? We look back and we see it all coming out in the UK COVID inquiry. Um, and we find out that Boris Johnson wasn't keen on the second lockdown. Rishi Sunak in The Spectator in August 2022, our own prime minister, said he was one of the few to speak out about closing the schools. Um, he was against that. Um, he said, oh, it's not just, you know, let's think about the economy. Let's think about the schools. So they were very much on a page. There were lots come out about the Great Barrington Declaration and how difficult it was to make that decision to lock down everyone. Um, when it had been debated, within the, you know, the important, the people making decisions in government, it had been debated whether to shield and shelter the vulnerable, um, to, to follow an age targeted, you know, focused protection strategy where the vulnerable and elderly are protected. But what they decided was it was gonna be very difficult because you'd have young carers coming in and out of those settings, for example. So there were mm -hmm. difficult decisions to be made, but they didn't share that with the public. We weren't allowed to have or hear those other views. We weren't allowed to debate it. I got removed from a local Facebook group because I was, concerned about the vulnerable during lockdown we weren't even allowed to express it we went crazy and now we mm -hmm. find out that senior politicians thought and felt exactly the same way as i did and other people did um, and those professors from stanford and oxford and harvard who are part of the great barrington declaration incredibly senior and experienced journalists faced so much abuse smearing by newspapers like the guardian who now coming out um and and reporting on the covid inquiry and it's a real embarrassment for, 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 for journalism that period. I mean, that's really why that book is called Shame, When Journalists Stop Listening. And I have to say, the work we all did with our mobiles, on new media, which is, people call it social media, it's not, it's power, too, far more powerful than that. The work we did is making a difference. I'm seeing a lot, I'm seeing the BBC, uh, I think, very really different. For the last six months, I've really noticed. Um, right. I do think that they have become far more aware of the power of the people and the information being shared. They've just been a bit very slow to catch up. Yes. Wow. And um, so what put you on the path of being a journalist in the first place? I, uh, good question. So I'm, I, I studied theology and anthropology. Then my mum, I wanted to go to London, but my mum said, oh, it was a time of recession and there weren't a lot of jobs around. So I ended up in the Channel Islands working for a bank and I didn't enjoy it. I hated it. I stayed for two years because my mum said it would look good on my CV. And um, after that, I was 23 and I just thought, Anna, you're 23. What are you going to do with your life? What do you really want to do? You've done anthropology and theology. I was going to become a missionary. I wanted to, to, to work for the church. Then I wanted to, then I went and worked at this bank, which was just dreadful making rich people richer. Journalism mm -hmm. um, was about the variety, meeting people and, and learning every single day and having experiences. And my uncle was a journalist at the Citizen newspaper in Gloucester. He said, do not go into journalism. And he kind of said he saw the same stories because he was near to retirement, same stories coming over and over again. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. the human condition and our behaviour and certainly the cycle of news, we do see the same stories and it's, it's getting more depressing, if anything. So anyway, I went into journalism. I really enjoyed it. It was great fun. I do the, the, a lot of presenting because I was very relaxed on camera. Um, I ended up one of the main presenters at ITV in Birmingham, ITV Central. Then I went to BBC South Today as a presenter. I was a good presenter and I'm still a good presenter. And But now I read an auto cue off my mobile and I read, <laughs> I used to do all of it. I'm a, I, I call myself, I'm a TV presenter on, on social new media for you guys. So, um, but when it, it, what really happened was 2016, I saw a lot more information being shared, like the WikiLeaks emails from Julian Assange and some pretty dodgy stuff, which is what I talked to uh, Robbie Williams about when I interviewed him. The, um, 
the emails between, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta. Um, there was some, some, well, some information was released and then Trump got in and then I just started to hear really awful, worrying stories about maybe some BBC bad panoramas, for example, had filmed a staged event and that panorama had been removed from all platforms so you couldn't see it, the BBC. I felt that journalism needed to be investigated because information was coming to light that really concerned me. And uh, so I just thought, well, I have to do this. A calling? I don't know. I guess I was born... I was born this way, but also my dad's a huge inspiration. So my dad um, is a Christian. He's a rebel. He was a very, he, he was worked in sort of rough secondary schools and uh, he was very political. He was put forward as a Labour MP. Um, but he, it was on my birthday actually, had a, he had to do a meeting. I think it's called a Hustings. And he said, well, I can't do it that night because it's my daughter's birthday. And they said, well, you're not cut out for this political career then. <laughs> and I, God. I was, you know, he loved the Labour Party. He hated Margaret Thatcher. And I'll never forget uh, being very involved in the campaigning with my father for the Labour Party back then. And we used to go, you know, we used to go around my dad's old banger with like a megaphone, you know, getting people to come and vote, um, you know, how important it was for those socialist values of caring for uh, all members of society. And uh, and then there was a front page of The Sun and it was called, it was a picture of uh, Neil Kinnock and it said, the last person to leave Britain turned the light out. Yeah. And they said that that front page of The Sun turned, turned the election because we were going to win. So I think maybe I realised at that point, journalism was more powerful than, po than politics. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's probably why I went into journalism I thought yeah and I remember when I was at ITV Central in Birmingham back in the day when we didn't have social media an MP called Keith Vaz used to constantly be hanging around to get on TV to get on TV news because it was so important because he didn't have his own Twitter account back then of course so we were very important to politicians how we represented them how much airtime we gave them um, obviously the media is not the older media brands you know, BBC and the likes aren't as important as they used to be because people can just broadcast directly now as politicians to, to, to the public and they can go on alternative media as well. So when you found out about the um, Podesta um, emails, were you working within mainstream, um, you know, BBC or ITV at that point? No, I wasn't. I was doing my, um, it was 2016, I uh, was just finishing, so yeah, no, sorry, it was 2018, it really kicked off for me, I think, really, that's when I started to, so I started dating a guy who was um, very much into alternative media, and he started to share stuff with me about 9-11, and a lot of it was absolute junk, but some of it I thought, well, hang on a second, this is interesting, I'd always be an open mind and listen, and, and you know, listen to something, of course I would, um, and then he made me more aware of the, you know, the pedestrian emails. And I wasn't working as a journalist. I was doing corporate work. So I was earning really good money working for corporates, but I was also doing investigative journalism. I was working for free with um, mm -hmm. whistleblowers and victims and survivors of abuse. And one particular woman I can remember came to one of my workshops, which we were able to fund for free, thanks to a, a book that was sold uh, for a chap called Michael Tarraga, he donated all the profits to assist other people who were victims of abuse or injustice. And Jan Cruikshank came to my workshop. We did a video with her. So she was raped by her, by a senior colleague at work. They then called her a liar and she lost her job. And she did a video with me on the workshop. It reached a million people on Twitter. And then it was picked up by a journalist who worked for uh, the Herald in Scotland, a national paper. And she eventually got a payout of £50,000 and an apology. So this is a message of hope. So from coming to the workshop, if I, you know the videos that she did, the help I gave her to get her story out there, and then the embarrassment that put on the organisation alongside, obviously, the, it helped that it was on the front page of a national paper in Scotland. She got justice. She got justice. She was determined. Um, 
-hmm. and not everyone has a happy ending like that it's not easy but I, I do really believe that we have a huge amount of power if we do it properly if we're ranting and we're angry and we're overly emotional and just we just spend all day on social media being angry it doesn't work but if we're calm and we're certain and we're sure and we put it across in a the information across in a way that gets people to listen um it's very powerful it's very powerful mm-hmm. like it was in the case of, of jan Cruikshanks. so no i was doing work um well-paid work and also doing this other work on the side and then that was up from 2018 to 2020 which is when um obviously covid started and that's when that book really picks up all about my interviews and yeah i think a lot of people um were already still on edge um because that a lot of what happened didn't make a lot of sense i think it was not so much the first lockdown you know it was the second lockdown and the closing of the schools and the third lockdown and we'd have like four we had weeks and weeks of no excess deaths and then they locked us down a second time and then the vaccine passports that didn't make any sense so i just think a lot of it was you know was it cock up or conspiracy and uh i think what's happened is the people that i was in touch with are very much focused on a future worried about a future that might be coming along you know they talk about how there's plans for a digital currency and uh the financial system is going to change and we're going to have digital ids and um we're going to have no freedom and i can understand why they think that based on that very crazy period but it's not a good it's not a good energy to be in fear for the future um being and that's what our papers so our papers sell fear don't they and um they know that it's I don't know if it's highly addictive or... Not just our papers, Telegram and many channels are full of fear. Unity News Network, a woman called Jackie Devoy. Uh, I think it's toxic, horrific, some of the, some of the content on, on some alternative media channels. I have no problem in saying that. They can't sue me for defamation because it's an anonymously held opinion. Um, they lost, they, they, they were regulated at one point, but uh, I think there's some really awful fear porn out there in the alternative media world as well. Definitely. I know when I started, um, I think it was around Hillary Clinton and Trump going up against each other and I was learning about the pedestrian emails. Um, And uh, yeah, and I remember just thinking, oh my God, I've got children, you know, what have I done bringing them into this world? And now um, I just see, yes, a very different. And and, that, and, now, and then I started to question, yeah, the alternative, because you think, hang on, where, where are the people saying this is actually an opportunity for us? Um, and it didn't feel like there's, and I still don't know if there's anybody um, apart from yourself now, but I don't know if there's any anybody on the alternative this is very depressing. This is upsetting that you said that. You said that just before we started recording. You said there's not many people out there providing solutions and hope. And um, I want people to know, especially for the Against Vaccine Passport campaign, that we were very successful. We won. You saw what happened in the rest of Europe. You know, I was talking to, um, I went on holiday to Paris and in France, if you worked in health or education, you had to have a vaccine. Um, in And then these vaccine passports that were brought in in Ireland, this woman's dog ran into the restaurant, but she couldn't go in because she didn't have a vaccine passport. A woman in Lithuania had um, to buy, couldn't buy um, baby milk. She couldn't buy baby milk for her child because she didn't have a vaccine passport. Um, we ran a campaign here, the Together Declaration as well, I remember giving out a thousand free T-shirts at a demonstration in London and people don't seem to realise how different it was here because of the action we took. Mm -hmm. 3,000 businesses on that directory. Um, It was a crazy time. I've still got all the leaflets under the stairs here. I'm very proud of what we achieved. So people need to realise how powerful they are. Um, There wasn't enough of that. There wasn't enough of that celebration that, of that fire you know that courage so many people wonderful people showed so much courage 
and they put them that really put that at the beginning of the book um they put other people first you know the book is for those who inspire me driven by courage and compassion not self-interest or financial reward um for those whose reputations have been damaged because they were solely driven by a concern for the voiceless and i want those people to realize that they well done and thank you um mm -hmm. It's a shame for me that a lot of them went to GB News and Talk TV. Some of them sit next to uh, Piers Morgan, who I cannot stand. That's sad. That's not the future for me. Another news channel wasn't really. What I was saying in the book really is why Why don't any of these news channels, any of them, the BBC, for example, and maybe they will if anyone watches this, attach a citizen journalism department, show people, give them the tools to share these important stories in a way that is a powerful um you know, if you've got nothing to hide, why not share these powerful skills of, of communicating in a way? So, you know, a whistleblower from an organization in the past, you just wouldn't hear from them. But now we will hear from them. Um, mm -hmm. But there's so, much, there's so much junk out there. There's so many people I know who have Twitter accounts and they, they've they had professional careers, right? Earning good money and quite a few people like this. And they call themselves some stupid name on Twitter and they share all sorts of crap. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? And they could be abusive because they're hiding. They're not showing who they really are. They're not putting mm -hmm. themselves out there. They're not taking any risks. Um, and they and then they are, they judge me and tell me what I should be doing. Right. <laughs> they didn't take any risks. I mean, like I said, if I hadn't got the income I had from the property, I wouldn't have done what I did. I don't think I'd have done that. Because I had to pay for the, I had kids, a single mum, I had to pay bills. So it's all very well to, to, to say I was brave, but I was brave because I just about could afford to be brave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the problem, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's so to summarize though, as we, I know we're running short of time, the future of journalism, what does it look like to you? We're all journalists. So we're all content creators. So it's all a case of building our own brand. So I've seen people that I interviewed back in 2020 really grow some, but certain voices can really grow on social media, new media. Um, so I think we've really got to realize that we're all basically journalists and the new news channels of the future. It's not the BBC and ITV and Channel 4, it's Facebook. They're our boss, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Um, it's about sharing what we care about, uh, maybe talking about the things that matter to us and shaping our future and not expecting it to happen overnight. It'll happen gradually. So being really aware of the power that we all have. Um, and also, if you guys can come to my workshops, hopefully that would help too, because you'll understand how I can create video and add subtitles with 80% of content and watch with the sound off. That's important. How can I write a good text introduction that's not clickbaity, but to get people to watch? How do I build relationships? Um, and it's also really important that I think a lot of us are spending time on one media brand, maybe in our echo chambers. So it's very important that we try and watch everything because then we can stay united and we can communicate with each other. Um, I think we've really got to be aware of as well as the power of and the connection, as I've mentioned before, between journalism and politics. So, you know, we have the power now to um, promote independent candidates or, you know, I like the Lib De Liberal Democrats at the moment. They were against vaccine passports and they really listened to their membership. Um, they suit who I am and my values at the moment um, and how I can help instead of leafleting or door knocking, uh, you know, which is the traditional way of campaigning politically. There's so much you can do via video now um, if you want mm -hmm. to support a political party. And I don't care who, who the party is. I think the may the best man win, I believe, in evolution. I've got the tool to share with people. So let's see how we use it and let's see how we grow. Let's not sit in a place of fear about the future. Let's sit in a place of power and love um, and use our, use our mobiles and what we do if we are publishing content as journalists. Uh, let us create the future, have a vision of the future that, we, that we're going to be proud of for our children when we die, when we leave. I think AI is coming along, so trust is going to become very important. Live broadcasting as well, because a lot of video and images are being manipulated. It's going to become more and more difficult for us to understand maybe what's happening on the other side of the world. Um, AI is going to get, oh, I've been thinking a lot about AI. <clears throat> and I think it's, it's going to be very important that we build trust 
very, very important. Um, mm -hmm. And for someone venturing out, you know, someone who's left school and is at a crossroads in their life, um, what would you suggest really to so that we don't find ourselves in the world that you find or other people find themselves that they're stuck in a situation where they can't speak their truth because they risk losing everything well i think it's changing and I, I do understand i mean i think we have to push for that um authenticity where we are ourselves you know like you go on linkedin and it's like oh the people aren't being themselves you know i can understand there's certain things you must share but if you're a young person um, and you're watching a lot of junk on TikTok, just don't watch it. Start creating content, valuable stuff, you know, how to uh, make a cake or, you know, cut, do wood carving or valuable, wonderful things, right? You know, writing music, playing music, um, or just put your mobile away. I mean, if you, if you do sometimes just watch that short form stuff, it's just, it's just not good for us. Um, Mm. They're creating, and the thing is, what happens is you create what you see. So you, so if I'm on Twitter, I behave as everyone else is behaving on Twitter. If I'm on TikTok, I behave as everyone else is on TikTok. So you can produce longer videos on TikTok and Instagram, but at the moment, it's still very, for me, like I said, driven by money and ego. You know, am I going to be famous? Am I going to be rich? Just focus, mm -hmm. try focus. Try and focus on the really meaningful things in life, the valuable, meaningful things, you know, love, friendship, community, music, art. Um, and that, yeah, we are what we watch. So I think there's some, it's, the world is still such a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and like I said, just taking ourselves out of a place of fear um, and putting ourselves more in a place of love is, is going to be that is going to be the future but we've just got to see more of that content or be just follow those people they're out they're out there there's more and more of it more and more of these people coming along and saying we're moving into the fifth dimension i don't know what you think about that i'd like to talk to you more about your pedestrian <laughs> emails um we're running out yeah. of time i'd love to know, I know. More about how that changed you I know I haven't even scratched on your childhood either. So, um, um, but I am always interested that what makes a child. So you can have a family brought up in the same, uh, or children brought up in the same family, and one of those children will go and question, and the other one won't. And I'm always intrigued as to what. Um, and some people say, you know, we all choose our families, and we've chosen. Or people who question, or people who see the light, the world in a slightly different way, have chosen that family to try and sort of be the ripple effect. But um, <laughs> were you? I mean, I, I follow all sorts of people. I'm not too embarrassed to say they they say that maybe there was a calling, and uh, spirits were brought here into, into the bodies. You know, around 1947. Um, they, I don't, I don't look into into it a lot. But you know, my dad, for example, he's just full of love and light. And I just just feel like I chose my and my mum. All the experiences I've had have led me to where I am today. So I think um, when I die, my body dies, but I don't die. I'm absolutely certain of that. And I've watched so much stuff on YouTube now. There's a channel called Coming Home, I think, and it's all about these people that have died and come back to life. And uh, they all have very similar experiences. So I believe um, that God, Source, Love is running through me, and I'm not saying it's not running through maybe my brother and sister, but they were on a different path. Mm -hmm. I've so they, through, yeah, I've been through some really, really intense experiences as well that I've learned from. I've grown every single decade. I've grown, and I look back and I wonder why I didn't do more of the caring profession. I was going into presenting and being a journalist because I had quite low self worth and I loved the attention. But then I became aware of that, and I started to be a counselor, a therapist. And I've um, I've had some amazing experiences and I've just learned from them, I think, and hopefully come out stronger. Not always. It's been difficult. But, I've, uh, you know, some some periods of my life have really, really hit rock bottom. But I've come back. I've come back up. And yeah, I, I, I when I'm around people that have this depth, do you feel it as well? Yeah. Just, you know, people that have been through re really quite 
a variety of, of life experiences and have grown. You can just feel it when you're around them. Um, yeah, someone said to me that you've either got to have had some kind of trauma in your life or be married to someone who's had trauma to um because then I think you really start to think how could this ex how could this have happened in this world that we all believe is like this nice safe I, I don't know particularly lonely you know with your child did you just think how can things like that happen like you said you were bullied at school and you think well why why I don't know what kind of world thinks that it's okay to bully another child um and I'm guessing they were, you know, they don't come from great parenting and they're probably put down at their home. So they need to project that onto others. Um, but you just think it's such a messed up world, isn't it? I feel like we've got a lot to unravel. The, the people that, that, that really shine brightly and are very inspiring. Not that I'm saying I am, but I know Elon Musk is, is, is very powerful most powerful man in the world he was horrifically bullied and he was yeah, beaten up and his dad and his dad said that he deserved it pretty much implied um so various wow. different experiences we we have and at the time you certainly don't value them as being useful things that you learn but you come out if you can come out the other end deeper more appreciative of um oh just it it just Trauma, yeah, trauma. It definitely is, and it and it's whether you you can turn that into something beautiful, something really dark and awful. You can turn it into something beautiful. Yeah, and that's. I think we're quite well. I'm quite an impatient person, and when I started seeing the world differently, I realised I had a lot of work to do to actually. It's like you've got this big jig jigsaw, um, and you've got a join all put all the pieces together and that's going to take a long time but once and you'll never I don't you know I don't know if I'll ever truly know um what is well no one will ever know truly what's going on but equally then you I remember feeling like the ground underneath me wasn't any it wasn't solid anymore and it was like sand and uh, I just but then suddenly something happens and you realize I can't go any lower now and the only way is up and um and that's when you think look around we live on this beautiful planet we are so lucky um and it's just building that strength up to remind and yourself the power, the power of forgiveness so if someone's hurt you if you if you've had the power through jesus christ to forgive for you know that that will set you free um to to love to love those who've hurt you that's very powerful um it is isn't it? It's I just feel that uh, we are work, we are going into a light, period of light, and the dark. You know that's what it is. It's good and evil, and the and the and the, the darkness. Because all those stories are coming out now. It's going to be painful and difficult. It's a time of chaos. It's going to take time, but we're going to get through it. And those stories are being exposed, you know, of corruption, abuse, and injustice. But it's just about standing strong steadfast and not being overwhelmed and sickened in anxiety for what um but, but being but feeling that we have a voice we are not powerless anymore we are not no exactly and you just need to walk out of your door I think a lot of people will be feeling so isolated but you always sometimes when you walk out the door you see something beautiful or you uh see an exchange with two people that you think that was incredible and uh you know, and um, and then you realise that there's so much. The majority of people on this planet are incredibly nice people that are just trying to do their best. And there's a few very dark souls. So I always think we'll win. Absolutely. Angry people. I learned this when I did therapy. Angry people are hurt. And uh, if someone's shouting at you, you're screaming at you, and swearing at you, they're hurt inside. Hmm. If you fill your heart with love, you're, it's not easy. It's not easy. You know, I have good days. I have bad days. I'm sure you're the same. Um, but I found it difficult where I live because I, like I said, I was ostracized from the community for during lockdown, just for questioning it. And I'm not now involved. I don't know when there's events. I don't know when they, someone's given away a fridge or when someone's lost their keys. So, and it's very difficult mm -hmm. here for me to meet there's kindred spirits so I spend some time in London and I've found communities where I can just be myself, <laughs> just be stupid, um, just 
yeah, so people, because um, I lost my community a bit really as well, because like I said, they become scared about the future and they talk a lot about, you know, dark stuff that might be coming. And I don't want to talk about that. I'm not really interested. I'm not really interested in divisive issues either, like gender and I'm not, just, just not interested. And look, I really like Bev Turner and Neil Oliver and they went to GB News, but I don't like GB News. I think it's causing more division. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, I just, I saw, I, they talk a lot about what Im- immigrants coming here and what crimes they might commit. Patrick, whatever his name is, I just thought, I can't watch you watching that. That doesn't feel right to me. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel like it's speaking, you're speaking from a place of love. But so I've, I've my community um, now for me is very much people who are uh, f- focused on content creation, building trust um, and new media. Um, you know, brave people like the lady who was raped and turned it around. Brave people who are determined and courageous and uh, focused on today and what they can do. People like you looking for uh, solutions. Ooh. Um, cause that's really exciting and I'm glad to have met you. It's a shame I'm not live. I don't live closer. I've made some wonderful friends all over the country. There's a fabulous church in Yorkshire where I was invited to just wonderful people. I felt a home. I felt oh. at home. Do you know what I mean? And it's difficult sometimes to, to, to find that, to have that feeling. It's really difficult. Yes. Yeah. For years I was looking to move abroad. I thought like, I can't, I'm a stranger in my own country. And, uh, and now luckily, um, yeah, through actually COVID now, um, it's connected us with all the like-minded people in our community. And now they're actually all community focused. So it's not about judging people anymore. It's about, let's just actually enjoy these times and bring a bit of joy back into our lives. And, um, yeah, focus, as you say, on all the positives and all the light that instead of all dwelling on all the darkness. Um, but yeah, well, thank you. What a lovely interview and a chat with you. Um, thank you for your time. It's massively appreciated. And yeah, just a reminder to read Shame. It's a really good book. Um, a really it's easy a horrible book. It's a horrible book and the title's oh, horrible. It's, it's a horrible book. book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My other book, oh, Making the News, Making the News 2018, will lift your vibrations. It's a <laughs> this is a sad book. Well, it is. I uh, know, but I guess because I've come through it, I'm able to look at it in a distance way now. So it's nice reading it because you think, my God, I can't believe that was so, so recent. Um, but also the ending is really positive. I think because I know that you're focused on the way forwards. So I don't read it with... Um, um, thinking oh my god I actually read it thinking wow this is actually really exciting because um yeah it's got me thinking about what what we can do um yeah I just need to have the skills so I think I'm definitely gonna book um your next course when's your next one in London that's actually got vacancies I haven't I've got to put some more da- dates in the diary and and the one day course is a taster really we've got to come to a day two I would say two days is better but I just wonder, so many people have got busy lives, but I really do think a two-day workshop's better. So I'm going to sort that out for next year, and I'm trying to keep the cost as low as I can, really, to to, to enable all sorts of people to be able to come along, because the class sizes are small. I can't really teach more than 10 people. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a nice small group. It's great for networking. People pay a lot of money just for networking, so you're networking and you're learning. So, yeah, definitely yeah. come along. It'd be wonderful to see you there. Yeah. Yes. I can't wait. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, hopefully see you soon. See you soon. Thanks for inviting me on. That's all right. Bye-bye.